Thank you, first of all, for these amazing <coughs> presentations that are extraordinary and not at all ordinary, but also uh, so different from each other. And uh, there are a couple of things that struck me in these um, presentations. And um, one is the discussion of the albums, the two albums that we discussed in some detail, um, in T's paper and Deb's paper. Um, and the investment you both had in reading stories, uh, in trying to figure out a story, ways in which we try, try to piece the lives together from the intimate estrangement, from, the, from a, a, a real distance, but yet uh, also a real investment. And I think um, ways in which identity plays into that, um, the, the real connection you had, Deb, from your lifetime of engagement with African-American photographs and African-American albums and African-American lives and their forms of display and connection. And T, you're getting to the, the Vietnamese album and connecting that to your work and your life. Um, and then on the other hand, Drew's uh, reminder that these things, these objects that we invest with so much meaning are produced by corporations for corporations and are also play, um, you know, are, are political and uh, are used for in the technologies are can be used in many different ways for us and certainly also against us. And so I wanted to see if we could put these these very different readings into conversations. What do we do with the val the emotional value of these objects? Um, that Barbara, you also brought out, um, and the ways in which they serve purposes that, that, that the technologies that produce them um, serve such um, amazingly uh, impersonal and also contrapersonal um, ends. So I was wondering if we could try to talk about that, uh, that question a little bit. And then um, I think that it would also be great if we could get, um, if we could come back to the notion of vernacular in the way that Barbara brought us back to it and talk about the contradictions in the very term um, and its usefulness now. So, that's broad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was excited about just different ways of reading the album. Um, when Brian called and, and shared with me that this was a, a spectacular moment to look at an album, and I always thought about my father's um, album. Um, and unfortunately, when he passed away, I had a chance to really go through the album without his voice. And I asked my mom, Who, how did my sister Yvonne get her name? And my uncle told me, mind your business, right? So he said, keep it quiet. Okay. Don't start anything. So I know there was Greta, there was Yvonne, there were all of these <laughs> names, because my father was in Germany and he was in, um, in Paris. And so women played a, a role in the family album. So I thought, wow. Um, so then my uncle told me to mind my business. So I decided to kind of look at albums from, mili from a military point of view, how men travel, how they had the freedom to have an interracial relationship without the fear of being lynched. They could have a sexual relationship, they could have a love relationship. And, and then the, the whole aspect of being men and free, I was excited about exploring that through the experience of my reference to my own family album. And so that gave me that opportunity to think about migration, um, home, the home front, and women in work. I love the fact that there's a, a, there's a piece in there about prostitution, you know, like freedom to sex workers. And, and there are words that are pasted on the pages. There are also words that, that describe love and, and, and bravery. So there's this multiplicity that we can see when we see um, images of black men that aren't just one and two-dimensional, that we see a range of images of, of that experience. 
I'll pick up on the point about value um, that uh, you raised at the end. Um, I don't, I'm not particularly, like the question that animates my research is not about aesthetic value. It's never been about whether or not um, my location is not, that means that my, my concern isn't whether or not this is art. I'm invested and deeply committed to other kinds of issues um, which are again about the social practices of photography, um, how they make and unmake subjects, how they form and deform histories. Um, and so when value, when I allude to value, it is about kind of the, I guess, um, the, the systems of privilege that have and desire um, that um, are behind that that sustain this privilege that enable some subjects to say uh, find certain albums in my case the this the search for the story of South Vietnam because his again this is a history that's been deformed or, or completely erased out of conventional archives um, it's about um, understanding too that there's an active market amongst the Vietnamese diaspora trying to locate these materials, mm -hmm. and so this has um, driven up uh, kind of the the value of those artifacts. In um, it's it's sold openly in South in uh, it's not South Vietnam, but anyway, it's it's sold in the South um, in present day Vietnam. Um, but then I'm at the same time I was curious about kind of the the interest in U.S. histories of this particular war through kind of quotidian objects, everyday objects. And you know, G uh, my understanding is that GI albums, like some of the ones that we've seen here, are extremely valuable. They become very, very valuable. So why? Why is it, is it a taste for nostalgia? Is it an attempt to kind of um, refashion this particular history to make it mean something else um, for kind of a post-memory generation? Or is it um, kind of a Ken Burns effect in a different way, mm -hmm. um, but it's still kind of a desire for for um, reanimating. It seems to me, or, or kind of a nostalgia for a particular kind of narrative of the war that I'm I'm trying to push back against. So and so this is why I also feel that when the personal comes in, at least in this presentation, it's about um, remembering to locate myself, but also um, I guess. Uh, an invitation, but also a caution that we also need to uh, locate ourselves within this work, because um, what we do with it through the collecting, curating, and researching of these materials means that we've actually formed a narrative about it, whether or not um, we acknowledge it. If it, it, even if it means asking the question again, that's not of interest to me necessarily, but certainly it's of interest to many members of the audience. Is this art? I sort of intentionally titled my um, presentation Loss, and Loss was an e meant to only capture um, the absence of an image, but there was actually financial loss mm. that companies yeah. experienced and tried to gain. Um, Polaroid was hugely mm. un an unprofitable business mm. endeavor. I mean, it repeatedly had losses, mm -hmm. um, but it also posed a threat to the film market because it combined the hardware and software together. Uh, and in some ways, it was in that space of the loss that we have these kind of rich and highly problematic discussions about um, some of the issues that we are trying to assign to the vernacular, about the ways that we see ourselves or the, the ways that we um, circulate images. The other idea of loss that I've been thinking about is um, in the last series of images on Lost and Found is this loss of color mm. that happens uh, with the images that are scattered across um, Ishiomaki and other parts of Japan as a result of the tsunami. Because in some ways, uh, as Deb was speaking, I was thinking about the richness of color of that photo album and how it survives over time. And the point to also remember is that's not easy labor, that many of these manufacturers who made these colored films would reply repeatedly um, varnish and other chemicals to the films uh, and the film products so that they would last over time. Mm. 
And here in this instance, we see natural disaster having the power to, you know, overcome human labor in some sort of way, creating a loss. But what is interesting for me, and I haven't quite worked this out, is this loss of color uh, and what that means for how we uh, read images. Mm -hmm. uh, and color is an important element to the process of the Polaroid uh, because it was that ability to see in an instant and to see in color and no longer in black and white. Mm -hmm. And so what that loss means is something I think is also worth considering. Um, so I, I had one more question while I have the floor, and then we'll, we'll open it up. And that has to do with the public and the private in some of these objects. I was very struck by, well, going back to Lee's presentation and the Kathleen Cleaver album, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here thinking, what business do we have looking at the intimacy of this family and this life, which, I mean, it's a very, you know, it's become a public family, but the album wasn't produced to be read in public. And that's where somehow, you know, I know I've been rejecting the distinction between art and vernacularity um, this whole two days and being very stubborn about it. But it struck me that uh, when artists make work, it's to be public and it's there for us to read. And even if it's work that's very private, like Sally Mann's photographs, for example, uh, and I know she got very exercised about the way people were reading her images and, and very upset. But it, it, you know, she put them out there as, you know, in a gallery, and it's there for all of us to read. As we, when people publish their memoirs or their autobiographies, um, they're put they're put out there for us to read. Um, when journalists publish images, they're there for us to read, and we might argue whether, you know, we're meant to, you know, how how much how deeply we're allowed to probe. But a lot of the things we're looking at here and that, that Arthur Walter is collecting and that we're looking at in the exhibitions are actually not meant to be looked at in that way or weren't originally meant to be looked at in that way. In, the, in that way. And when we try to piece together a family or a life and look at the, the you know, soldier's prostitution, who did he actually you know, go into you know, the brothels and um, displaying their sexual life, who was this meant to be looked at by, and what are we doing when we probe deeply into these private lives? So I was wondering if you had some thoughts about that, because I saw also a lot of protection going on in our readings and the hesitation in um, probing here, and there was a kind of ambivalence, I think, on behalf and in a, a number of our speakers in trying to um, expose these lives. And it, it's sort of where we started with Patricia's talk and Ariella's talk, um, objecting to the photographer's exposure of lives that were not meant to be seen in that way and in those contexts. I, I, I think differently about this album that I, I looked at. I think there is a sense of pride in that album that, that they, because of mobility that he wanted or whoever he or the person who collected the album wanted it to be circulated. They wanted to publicly let, even if it's not in the family, others know about racism, about their experiences of travel, their, their home life um, because of the photographs. I felt that the album, the way that the uh, words were pasted on the page because it came out of the public that it was an art moment, and I thought it was a creative moment, mm -hmm. an artist book in a sense, or some type of craft mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. that wanted to be circulated. It, it was calling for people to know that it existed. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that I would just kind of push back on that as the personal, because there was a sense of pride in all of the photographs. Mm -hmm. um, even the pride of religion or spirituality, even the pride of, of the meal that they, that the first meal for Thanksgiving in 1941. So there is a sense of look at me, look at my travel, and so that's how I felt about mm -hmm. the, the album. I thought it was more not as personal. So what, what role does anonymity play here? I think that in many instances, um, that is say we, um, and presumably, um, I, I mean in other words, how much, 
wouldn't it make a difference if you actually knew who the person was? I mean, the name isn't enough. But there's a, there's a way in which once the objects have been severed from an identifiable, that is to say, the person is identified but not identifiable. And the interesting question is, if any of these materials are shown and a member of the family recognizes it, then does that put this into another whole category? Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which the, with the passage of time, with the dislocation, with the loss of connection to anybody who actually has firsthand personal relationship with the subjects, there, there, there emerges a kind of anonymity. And the question is what, is, what is your moral obligation to people you don't know? I would say that's true for artists as well, because a lot of some of the artists that I've looked at um, who work with family photos, they work with found family photos mm -hmm. that were not meant for public display. Um, so it's not so much the case that it's you know researchers who are on the hook for this kind of thing. Like we're all part of this this uh, transfer um, and circulation. And Vic Maurice cuts them up, right? I mean, yeah. so it's not even, you know, it's a very different kind of treatment of these images. But uh, I was thinking back on Nicole's point of the, you know, people who wanted to take the photos back home with them and not have them, you know, just assuming that you own them. I just wanted to quickly say, I mean, in crafting my remarks for today, I, I thought it would be too easy to show you the photographs that I was talking about. So in some way, I wanted to inflict a type of loss onto you all and to sort of expose my own thinking. I mean, it would be too easy for me to show you what was being seen in Mozambique at the same time mm -hmm. that of the time periods that we're all speaking of. It's just too easy to show those images because not everyone has that vision or access mm -hmm. at their disposal. Um, and so I just think that there's a way in which um, that, that is one aspect to the loss. And the other aspect to the loss uh, or anonymity is that I think um, we too often think of things as being too consistent. And in the case of Chun-Li, who I know Deb knows really well in his work, what is so interesting is, is that when he uploads these Polaroids to Instagram uh, in his project Fade for Resistance um, and is connected to people, um, they don't ask, they, don't, they say that they don't want him to send back his, their Polaroids, but they're also at, not asking for them to be destroyed. Hmm. They're okay with them just being out there. Right, and maybe at some point they will want to see them again or be reunited. But the image does not necessarily have to be back to be recognized, right? So it, it, it's that the, the, the idea of anonymity is also in flux. And I find it incredibly powerful um, in recent times when we're seeing all of these natural disasters and people are being separated from their images, what we see on the news is the image that is left because in many instances they don't have images from which to bring, but the digital is, of course, changing that because mm -hmm. if you have your phone. Okay, so we have a number of questions. Gil, then Sean, and Tina, um, to start with only. Uh, thank you for your great presentations. Um, I have, uh, I think it, it's kind of a, I think these are two related questions that are actually kind of one. I'm not sure. We'll figure it out. So um, the first has to do with, um, I guess, um, Deb's, uh, for, for me, your presentation reminded me that what I think maybe we haven't talked a lot about is this proxy pleasure that uh, we experience through photographs. Um, I mean, we've seen naked men, and we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of pleasurable images too. And we're, I, I, I have a sense that you know, it's it, in a way, it e is easier for us to talk about this ethical responsibility rather than to talk about the kind of the, the very fact that you know we're drawn to images because they also they, they they present pleasure. In your case, I think it's very interesting that in a way it's I call it proxy pleasure because it's also about sort of a gendered pleasure that that you, I, it's interesting that you identified with, with you know with, with a, a men's right to movement right etc which is something that um, isn't really available outside of the relationship to photography so this is kind of something I wanted to point out and in the other thing that maybe it's not related but if somehow in my head it is is this drive to um, tell the story. Mm -hmm. So first I have really a question about whether we really do, and I, that's also came up for me in the, in the panel that I chaired, uh, which I think the imperative to tell the story was very um, strong, and I am wondering if it is 
you know, the only way to talk about uh, photography, to fill in those details? And if it is, how much are we talking about photography? Because uh, this is really, you know, a winning of text over image. It's sort of like, you know, here the images aren't going to tell you, but I did all this research and here is what it really says, right? Something of that sort. So I guess it's, it's both a question of the relationship of image and text and about how much is it, uh, why can't we just, why, why, why not let those gaps be there? Uh, why, why do we need to tell these stories that the photos don't tell? Is it okay if we take a couple of questions with the panel, will you remember? Sean? Great, thank, thank you all so much uh, for these talks. Um, I think my question is mostly for Drew and T, and it really it's less a question and a desire to hear more. Um, because both of you, um, I think, in, uh, talked about inconvenient <coughs> evidence. Um, and you both spoke about um, what you called orphan images and orphan albums. And I think that in that word, orphan, like it has, uh, it connotes such uh, loss, but also like a desire to reconnect these images and albums with their. Uh, first owners, um, right, or to like truly identify them. And I think what both of you um, noted at different points in your talks was, in fact, like some of these images and albums, um, the owners would not want them returned, right? And so I was really struck by that. Um, and I would just love to hear you say more about that, about like the, the actual disconnection, the estrangement being desired by the creators of mm -hmm. those images and albums. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a Do you wanna do Tina? Tina okay, first? Tina, oh, and then Tina. if everybody can remember the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's time of day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, oh God, that's loud. Um, I wanted to ask about um, one of the images, Deb, in that album, that I wanna know if I was mistaken or not because it looked like there was an image in the center of one of the, the um, pages where the caption said something about a hunting ground. Mm -hmm. And it looked like he was holding a cadaver, mm -hmm. a severed head. And, and I wanna know if I'm mistaken, and if I'm not, the, the thing that was struck that struck me between um, T and um, Deb's talk was if we reinvoke this notion of the everyday within the everyday of the military, the life of a military soldier. What in what ways are these photo albums also documenting a kind of um, the everydayness of violence, mm. and how are we, in retrospect, in what ways are we willing or not willing to engage that? Um, and the reason I'm, I'm, I got stuck on that is because I recently was given a photo album by of my father, no, my my my, my father-in-law, who I've never met, but my brother-in-law found a photo album of his time in Africa during the Second World War, where he took all of these, he was, a, he was a physician, he was a dentist actually, and he took all of these photographs of various kinds of medical procedures that for him were very everyday. Um, to us, they were kind of horrific, but it was that kind of the ways in which the everyday of war of, milita of, the, of militarism mm -hmm. can become this, this desensitizing process. And so I wanted to hear more about the military part of mm -hmm. both of those albums and the ways in which the album allowed them to desensitize themselves mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. while finding these other dimensions. Yeah, it, I was about to say. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. I, I know I've seen it before. It, it is. wasn't with someone in. Mm -hmm. Right. Put it in his album. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was a souvenir. They, they, it was like it a was souvenir, souvenir photo. That, that GI survived. Yeah. That had. Yeah. Photo. 
18, 19 year old guys. I love it. Everybody's sisters. participating yeah. in this. That's, That's good. good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> But that's still yeah. horrific. Yeah. It's still, yeah. yeah. And it's the <laughs> shock. It's the, it's the shock yeah. of the image. But still, that the fact that he put it in his album, <laughs> friends at home, you know, mm -hmm. but he didn't actually do it. Well, I think that we're coming to, that's we're that's coming that's to. That's to that's 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 So if we were disturbed by the etymology of vernacular, we might think about what ordinary is in different circumstances and what everyday is. I mean, these are not benign terms. Um, thank you, Tina, for that uh, question and observation. Um, I don't mean to imply by looking at this military album um, that some, that that I wish to perpetuate kind of the, the ordinariness of its violence or somehow to cover it over. In fact, the pro my project is doing exactly the opposite. The book is called Warring Visions, and what it's trying to do <coughs> is to take kind of the image or take our understanding of war photography um, outside of, say, photojournalism, outside <coughs> kind of the... In e and so a, a military album actually uh, makes kind of the image of war quite explicit, um, even as it tries to kind of domesticate it by showing kind of the love that men have for each other, the ways in which they mourn each other. So other photographs, you, you have you know them sharing <coughs> the, the photos with each other, and they're inscribed in the back. And one of them has like two dates and two different handwritings. And the, the bottom says, OK, well, this person died on a specific kind, that specific date. So it's a, a memorialization. And so of course, there there is like this intense um, affect that is um, preserved in the album. But at least to my eyes, the violence of of um, the lives in the album is is nevertheless preserved, and I guess my my interest is always to um, look for um, this violence that's latent <coughs> in the ordinary um, and the everyday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your question. I, I thought about um, a lot of of just looking at the the combination or combining um, the the maker. Um, if it's not Bauman or the other names that were mentioned in there, that the humor that I found in, <coughs> in the creation of the album um, humanized it for me. It made it, um, it made me feel as if I was reading a novel, a graphic novel mm. that I wanted to find a story mm. that connected, was disconnected and disjointed, but then I kept coming back to I, you know, I didn't know the pages that they were the correct pages, but I, you know, I like reading different stories. I like finding a mystery, and I felt it important to create um, some type of mystery and and within the com combining of the pages and the text, and that's what I was looking for with with uh, pr putting this presentation together. So it was important for me to to find a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to say something about the notion of story and then get back to Sean's question about the idea of the orphan image. Um, in my context, I, what I really struggled with was the idea of how do you tell simultaneity when so many different images are being seen. So it's too easy to lose the picture that in Mozambique there was a colonial war without mm -hmm. thinking that African Americans within the Polaroid factory at the same time were protesting over shared concerns, right? but yet their shared concerns were very different. Uh, um, in some ways, the Polaroid workers movement wanted to protest surveillance in the US, and there were other different modes of surveillance being protested in the anti-apartheid struggle. And so in some ways, also what you find is images are popping up at different kinds of contexts, right? And I was like, great to see, see these images of Algeria, 
but how do you put those in together if you don't have the images? And oftentimes, the very historical actors that you're speaking of are not processing those images simultaneously, right? They're articulating their experiences um, through or orality or text or writing. And so in some ways, for me, the telling of a story is important to put these things into conversation to create the simultaneity mm -hmm. and no way trying to stand in for something. And then, Sean, into your question, I, what I've been thinking about is how this orphanage is in flux. And, in, and especially, I think, to build on Nicole's point of the space of incarceration in the prison when there's so many different types of forms of surveillance that are happening. Uh, in some ways, um, many people who were incarcerated uh, that I've taught or interacted with have wanted the Polaroid to say something else, to see themselves in a very different way than the, the, they, could, than they saw each other or the space of incarceration. Uh, and then strikingly, um, those images were also able, didn't have utility outside, right? Um, or they had utility because they were the only images that people um, had of themselves. And so in some ways, what I've also grappled with is the, um, the influx nature of people's changing relationships to this kind of orphanage or disabuse, disavowal of the uh, image. And I also think that that also happens naturally by the deterioration of Polaroids. One of the things that I didn't say in my presentation is you can't reproduce a Polaroid. Mm -hmm. uh, when it got to such bad quality, some people in my course were saying they would send out their Polaroid for redevelopment, but they would get a 35 millimeter print back because mm -hmm. you can't get a Polaroid again. Mm -hmm. It's only this kind of one-time thing. And so um, it's interesting also how it deteriorates on its own with time, and that's, mm -hmm. that cannot be preserved. So I think it also speaks to another type of technological orphanage mm -hmm. that is built into the, the medium itself. And, and just to think about the uh, collecting images as, as the soldier collected the image of this horrific um, moment um, of, of that severed head, but I, you know, it's showing the horror of war, um, the fear, um, othered experience, but then there's another image in the, on a, a similar page that says, I haven't, I haven't seen war yet, and I'm happy, mm -hmm. and so that balance of, of you know, the, the horrific, and the, like, I just want to have my drink in my hand, and, <coughs> and I haven't seen war. So that, that tension that happens with, with the album, and I totally agree that he found that image and he wanted to show the horror of war. And then mm -hmm. at the same time, his other friend who he's taken a photograph of, it's, I haven't seen war yet. So that's mm -hmm. that kind of range. Mm -hmm. so I think we have time for maybe a couple of more questions. Do you have a, your hand up? Um, so I'm someone who works on artistic photography, so um, the discussion about whether or not to sort of jettison vernacular strikes me as very sort of interesting because it's kind of like the modern, postmodern debate, right? Um, but what happens with that, um, particularly for the <laughs> materials that we looked at today, um, it seems that if we do jettison vernacular, then we've lost a place for um, the type of images that um, were so beautifully described today, right? That these particularly, um, and I'm speaking as someone who's African American and looking at images where people are trying to be um, recognized as artists, but can't because of racism, and then this space of vernacular is where images of blacks can somehow be celebrated. So if we do decide to you know, abandon this category, where can we invest the value that allows for um, us to combat racism, to combat uh, gender inequality, to combat uh, you know, um, anti-queer sentiment. Where do we shift um, that value? To what category do we move it? Um, I don't know if that was something that was raised in the conversation last night, but um, this was something that was particularly after hearing the sort of uh, last talk. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. that's my question. <laughs> Okay, um, one more okay. question next to you, and then Patricia, and I think that that'll be the end. Um, oh, sorry, he had yeah. 
Yeah, I'm um, just a little puzzled about this notion of a, a first use which gets lost and then it becomes vernacular. Because at least photo albums, they have a first use and a second use and a third use. They're already imagined you know, a certain use by the person who put it together, but there's also the hope that other people in the family or other people will reutilize it in a ways that can't be fully anticipated. It's a message towards the future, but I, I would just think that, you know, one should be looking, trying to find the photo album before it ends up in the flea market, before it's lost that connection to try and understand what actually is going on in there as a kind of historical document. I mean, I'm actually, I mean, Deb, you 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 were talking about that in terms of the, the, your family album, and there's been some mention of that. But you know, I think that when we can get that historical context, uh, you know, the 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 album becomes much more valuable. And and you know, I, I mean, I, in in my family album, there was this set of pictures of what looked like a mirror images. And I asked my mother, and she said, "Oh, yeah, those are the twins that." We're always being confused for each other, and they used to play on this. Thing. I mean, it, it was suddenly I saw those images totally differently because they're two, they're twins, they're not mirror images. Anyways, I could go on, but but that was, I, I just think the idea of vernacular as having lost its primary value. In some cases, sure, I can see how that makes sense, but in other cases, it seems to me that's important. Thank you, and then Patricia Hayes with the last question and a round of responses. Um, thank you so much, such a wonderful panel, and I um, especially appreciate the succinctness of um, Barbara's um, contribution and, and pulling so many things together <coughs> so beautifully, so thank you very much. Um, I want to ask about the strange temporality of the Polaroid photograph, um, because, you know, you've been talking about the fusion of the technology, um, the machine, the print, etc. cetera. Um, but Polaroid was a jump ahead of the other manufacturers because it removed the interval that people must wait for their, the delivery of the print. And um, I think it would be very interesting if you could say a little bit about that, Drew, the how to think about that interval and what that does um, in terms of the gratification of desire in a particular way and also how that gets take, taken up by the biometric project in a place like <coughs> South Africa and makes it so useful for surveillance purposes because you obliterate that temporal gap where your customer who needs the ID photo might not come back mm -hmm. to fetch it because uh, normal processes of developing. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, and I'm just thinking again of the male models who go astray and don't sh show up for a booking because they've got their hot dog and 20 bucks. <laughs> but <laughs> So there's something really important about the the bringing together of certain parts of a technological process that meets desires <coughs> for gratification and mm -hmm. for the control that we're talking about. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so any <coughs> brief Barbara responses? Barbara? Sure. So very interesting comment um, as to the vernacular as a kind of placeholder for um, I would say for photographs where there's an aspiration for the photogra those photographs to be appreciated as something more than or other than vernacular, but somehow or other haven't, haven't been able to make it. What I, where I would turn to is um, to ethnographic material. And, in the, and actually, my comments were inspired by my thinking about what I call the ethnographic object as an object of ethnography, as a disciplinary object. And in the case of museums, ethnographic museums that have holdings um, of, of such objects, um, and for example, the uh, Musée the, the, um, du Quai um, Orly in, in, in uh, Paris, there was a, tr a very strong move to il basically eliminate the category completely and to, in a sense, elevate these objects and to treat them as art, simply. <coughs> 
and not, not to make distinctions between ethnographic objects and art objects, etc. So in a way, um, I would say that, and also Miriam made a very interesting comment just informally last night, uh, that there's also pushback, um, and you, you, you had suggested, what, in Africa, that the idea of the vernacular was seen as demeaning, and that to refer to some material, photographs, of w whatever, but let's say photographs as vernacular, was not to treat them as having the um, added value, the added value of being vernacular, but rather as being somehow rather lesser than, let's say, art photographs or professional photographs or some other kind of photographs. So I, I don't believe that preserving the, first of all, I don't, I, I, I guess my, my pitch is not to think of the vernacular as a category. That, that's actually my pitch. To think rather as a process, as a mode of cultural production, as a, um, as a way of, um, if you will, adding value of a particular kind. And it's the question is, what is the nature of the value that's being added when something that, did, that was not born vernacular is appreciated as vernacular. So I see it as a, a kind of, um, a, you know, whether, it, so, so in other words, I would not want to think that um, individuals who have artistic aspirations, in a sense, settle f for vernacular as a kind of placeholder until such time as that work can be better appreciated. I would not, but I think the comment about lives is a really good one, and that is that I, I, I think of it in the plural, absolutely. There are many, if you will, first lives, because it is very much the social life of things, and there is a way in which these objects move, and they move across, they, or they, they may or may not move across generations, but there is a point at which they have a whole set of, a whole other set of second lives, plural, you know, whether they enter the market, they're dealers, the collectors, curators, um, and they may even move back. I mean, like repatriation, you know, for example, where they, they may, in fact, move back through that chain. So I'm not sure, that it's probably not really a good answer because I think your, your, your comment is, is really very well taken. I guess, um, Patricia, and to the broader question of the, the temporality, what I find interesting is how the Polaroid in some ways does make its sitter wait because they have to position themselves and the sitter has to, how they put themselves in front of the camera and there is this kind of momentary wait to get the image. But you're right, it does take out the notion that you would have to go to the lab and submit your ID, uh, your photographs and wait for them to be returned to you, which one could also argue that waiting also held a number of expectations and fostered desire um, and nurtured sentiments. And in not getting back your pho photographs in the case of identity documents, also produced a certain set of uh, possibilities too, because sometimes people didn't want ID documents, right? They didn't want them in the immediate because they didn't know what the impact was. But I guess the larger thing about Polaroid that I find really fascinating is it does create this moment of instantaneity, but it's also manufacturing this surveillance technology, the ID too. It doesn't mm -hmm. take it away that it is, you know, in order to make colored film, it's making this surveillance technology that is being mm -hmm. sold in South Africa that is allowing the South African government to create two ID photos, one to hand to ensure that the person had them, and then this archival, by you know, archive of images that the state holds. And I think one of the research that I found was that Polaroid, uh, the South African state, continued to use Polaroid into the early 2000s. So there was this massive reserve of Polaroids and this technology that continued to even be used after the end of apartheid, right? Um, but I do want to suggest that it doesn't necessarily take out the middleman, but it's forcing a new balance in terms of the idea of the technological development of the film, that it, the instantaneity is also based on another type of waiting. I don't know, uh, just it's something else is happening there. Any, I think we're out of time, so I'd like to really thank this panel and invite Brian and Tina to come up um, to make final comments. Thank you. So I'd like to start um, not by making my final comments, but by offering some thanks. And uh, 
Uh, everyone here has thanked us as organizers and Sarah, who's so graciously communicated with all the speakers, but there are a number of other people that we really have to thank. First of all, Catherine Lasoda, who, along with Sarah, worked on this conference uh, from the Columbia side, and uh, who was the producer of the conference uh, along with the School of the Arts, and I'd like to thank Gavin Browning and Carol Becker, who made all this possible. Without them, we wouldn't have had this fabulous space, and um, also Felix and... Uh, Aya um, and the, the team of ushers downstairs. There's a lot of labor to, that goes into producing this, so please give them a big hand. Fantastic. Um, this has been such an extraordinary event and so much to think about on all levels and on all fronts. Um, but I just want to say uh, a few things uh, about objects social histories and communities. Um, most of these presentations, perhaps all of these presentations, began with objects, uh, objects in the Walther collection and, and additional ones. Um, and these are, to me, objects that are not only orphaned, but they're abandoned and discarded. Uh, and so um, part of my interest in thinking about photography and the history of photography is to recuperate or salvage uh, these objects for closer investigation. Um, so the Walther collection is kind of orphanage <laughs> for these, <laughs> for these stray, um, stray objects, uh, which uh, really need to be given life. Uh, they're uh, as orphans, their um, backstories, their histories have often been uh, lost or curtailed or suppressed. Um, and uh, this particular selection of objects often represents the most invisible kinds of lives that we can imagine. Um, and so that's where I'm interested in the social histories that would otherwise perhaps not be explored for lack of uh, documentation. These are key historical artifacts of those uh, uh, suppressed or oppressed lives uh, and, and a way of reanimating them and their histories uh, through new methodologies. And I think uh, what's really impressive to me is that um, scholars and curators and writers and critics have gathered from a wide range of disciplines to bring their specific expertise to um, an otherwise closed circle of uh, photographs that often, uh, again, don't exist in a single place but are often widely dispersed in archives, libraries, uh, occasionally museums. Um, and so uh, I, uh, I celebrate not only the advance of those methodologies, but the willingness of scholars to take on this assignment of giving new meaning to these fugitive objects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my last point is about communities. This is an extraordinary community that we have brought together here, not only the presenters, and I thank each and every one of them, but the audience, uh, which has been so patient and participatory and uh, engaged. Uh, and I think that really represents uh, not only our own personal and prof professional interests, but also the communities that these objects represent and speak for, uh, often which don't have a voice, which don't have a visibility, uh, and these approaches that we've uh, talked about here uh, give new meaning and voice to those objects in communities. So I thank you all for that. I, I am, am not a fan of organizers having concluding remarks because I really... Um, I really like for the participants to have the last word or the last words. And I think that we've had so many 
really profound um, contributions um, over the course of the day, last year and a half. What I will say is that I really do need to thank Brian and Arthur for setting up this as a model of engagement. I've never been, I've never felt luckier um, than to be part of um, this as a model, which is that you've extended to us an invitation to think about exactly what you're saying, a collection that is vast and valuable for so many different reasons and that has been reclaimed um, and is now being offered to us to think with. Um, and so that's one of the things that has really inspired me um, throughout the last day and a half, which is both the intensity with which every presenter has come to the question of the vernacular with, you know, with precision and care and critique, and at the same time, an equal amount of precision, care, and critique of the objects themselves. And so I've learned a vast amount about a collection that I have always known was, a, you know, a treasure, <laughs> you know, but that we've been able to share that in a public forum. So I just, I want to end with that as my reflection and my comment, and, and also to echo what you said about it's an extraordinary thing to have an audience that engages um, us and our aspirations and our questions um, so enthusiastically. So, so thank you for that. I didn't really mean to go last, but I guess. <laughs> but now you will. <laughs> um, I have to. Um, so several people have asked me this morning, uh, what do I hope to get out of this? Uh, and I think every all my colleagues wanted to help us get out of it what we initially wanted to get out of. And what I really wanted to get out of this is just to have this conversation, to have a space in which to think about these topics with such an extraordinary group of colleagues and friends and to create a kind of a space of possibility to figure out what are the burning questions right now about photography? And I think, and I, again, I want to thank Tina and Brian, um, Remy, um, for the initial conversations that we had. And we started having these arguments already almost a year ago, trying to think of how to construct this, con this symposium and how to engage with the materials in the collection and with the questions um, that are posed. And really, it almost doesn't matter how, what where we start, because I think we're ending up questioning all our own assumptions here, and I think that's what's so great about this. And so I'm, I'm here with many more questions. Should we be thinking about objects? Um, I'm tending to th think at the end of today about practices and about events rather than objects, and about how objects uh, participate, you know, become events uh, and become practices, the practices that produce them, but also they become part of our practice of talking about them. So that's sort of where, where I am here. But I also am struck by a comment that Barbara made earlier, which is that when we engage with some of these materials, we're walking, not touching, and the desire to touch and the ways in which touch actually has... Um, you know, these, the, all of these objects are marked by touch, but also ways in which we together have shared a moment of commonality that's very embodied, um, that, uh, that's been effective, that we, you know, we've been feeling things together in this room, maybe not the very same things, but feelings of loss, of nostalgia, of desire, of envy, of horror at some of the horrific um, images we've been seeing and thinking about. And so I want to just thank you all for making this possible. And I guess what I'd like to, sort of where I am is that taxonomies I don't find so useful, but uh, ways in which we put objects into circulation and the practice of discussing them and of producing them, of discussing them, and of assessing their afterlives in our work, I think that's, that to me is very precious. So as we walk away, um, I hope that we will all be able to continue to think together and that this is only the beginning of many conversations that we'll be able to have. So thank you all. Thank you.